so marvelous, so beautiful. Thank you, Kay Zhang and Andrew uh, Adams. Thank you for being with us today. It is a pleasure to have you. Do come again. We thank you for being a part of our worship. And grace and peace to you who have gathered here in this house of prayer and worship. Thank you as well for being here. You could have had a good excuse to stay home. Weather looks kind of threatening. It's Sunday morning. Get some extra sleep maybe. But thank you for being here. I hope that it will be a blessing to you. Let us come and worship the Lord. If you are able in body or in spirit, stand with our opening litany which you have in the bulletin. Our God, give ear to our words. Gracious Lord, give heed to our words of adoration. Hark to the sound of our voices, for to you we pray and give honor. O Lord, we enter your house and worship you with gladness. Make our way straight. Give us strength to follow you. Be seated. We seek the Lord at this time with our prayer of confession because we recognize that it is important to say that before the Lord 
where we have fallen short, how we have done wrong, so that we might have contrite hearts, so that we might seek the help that is beyond us. We are not self-sufficient. We are not self-made people. We depend on one another and we depend on God to get through this life. Amen? Amen. So let us seek the Lord with this prayer of confession that God may indeed hear our confession and we may know God's forgiveness. Let us pray. God of compassion and mercy, we confess before you that we live deeply selfish lives. We want to be generous people. We are thankful that in Jesus Christ we can be kind and generous people. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us that we will be moved to help people who are suffering. Guide us with your loving mercy in the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus Christ. In him, rescue us from our selfish way. Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. Friends, remember that you were baptized into the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The water was poured over your head. The water was poured over you, your head, your shoulders, your life, your whole being. When you were weak, Jesus died for us. And Jesus rose for us. And Jesus lives for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And let us pass the peace of Christ to one another at this time. Have a seat. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. There's only two, but my hands are full, aren't they? <laughs> How about we sit, you guys? I have a question. Claire, you're going to be able to articulate this a little better than Elliot, but he knows it too. Do you have rules when you go to school? Yeah. Do you have rules when you go to your summer camps? You want to sit with Daddy? Yeah. Okay. Well, Elliot, I know you have rules, too, in your classroom. Rules like no biting, right? No biting, no hitting. What are some rules in your classroom, Clara? Can you think of any? Be nice to each other. That's a good rule. Do you have to raise your hand if you'd like to speak? Yeah? Well, so rules are, rule, there's a lot of rules in the world. There's rules for our classroom, and there's rules... Uh, for Elliot's classroom, there's rules for camp. And you know what rules are for? Rules help us, I think. Rules help make things go smoothly, right? Yeah? Rules keep us safe. Rules give us some guidance for maybe when things are hard, it helps us work things out. You know, if things get complicated or difficult, rules can help us work things out. Is it hard to follow the rules sometimes? Yeah, it is. It is harder for some people than others, or harder depending on how you're feeling that day. Well, did you know what? God has rules too. God has rules. You know that. I know you know that, sweet one. God has rules for our lives. Well, there's a story in the Bible. There was a person who knew 
all kinds of things about the rules. This person studied the rules. Mm -hmm. This person studied the rules and knew all about them, but they wanted to make sure that they, they really knew the rules. So they went to Jesus, they heard about Jesus, and they knew Jesus was, was truly the most expert on the rules. So this person went to Jesus and said, I just want to make sure, I just want to make sure I know all the rules. What are, what are, will you tell me, Jesus, what are all the rules I need to know? And I can't help but wonder if this person was thinking maybe there'd be a nice long list, and maybe in that whole list there would be one that, that they didn't know yet, even though they were an expert. Maybe. Or maybe they were expecting like a long sermon, you know, like you have in church sometimes, an explanation. Well, you know what Jesus said? There's, there's just one thing. Of all the rules, the most important rule, and if you follow this one, you'll have a wonderful life. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said the rule is to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Now think about that. What did I say rules are for? Rules help make things go smoothly. Rules keep us safe. Rules help us work things out when things get complicated or hard. Do you think loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself could do all those things? They could make, keep us safe. That's a good rule to keep us safe. It's a good rule to make things go smoothly. It's certainly a good rule to make things, when things aren't working out or things get hard, loving God and loving our neighbor as ourself is certainly a good rule to follow to make sure that we can all uh, live in a joyful life together. What do you guys think out there? You agree? Seems like a pretty good rule, a, wor a rule worth following, and also no biting, right? We shouldn't do any biting. <laughs> How about that? Well, why don't we have a prayer? If the congregation will uh, repeat after me this prayer. Thank you, Jesus, Thank you, Jesus. For, loving for loving us and teaching us, and teaching us. The, most the most important rule. Thank you for teaching most of all by your word and your action. Help us to follow you. Amen. All right, my friends. I think you can go with Daddy. They're snapped in that direction. So you could chase, and then you got it.
That was just marvelous, wasn't it? Just marvelous. Okay, rule number one, no biting. <laughs> rule number two, not a long sermon. <laughs> Boy, challenge this morning. <laughs> this morning we have a passage that is very familiar to us, a parable that Jesus tells. Jesus is making his way through Israel, and he's been healing people, various people, people that, hmm, the religious establishment might find questionable, people who were what we might, as old-time religion, call sinners, just good down-to-earth sinners, all right. So, you know, they weren't the up-and-coming, they weren't the ones who watched their P's and Q's and that kind of thing, but they were just down and out. And Jesus was helping them and healing them. And so we have this hot shot, this guy, he's a religious lawyer, we call him. He's called a Levite, that's the technical term. And he comes to Jesus and he wants to put Jesus to the test. I guess to see if Jesus is orthodox enough. I know after all he's doing, handling, treating, and working with these people. Are you really orthodox, Jesus? Or are you really an outlier working for Satan? Oh, well. So, so here's what we have. We have this. I'm going to just start with this part. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, you know that when it comes to inheritance... You don't inherit it by earning it, do you? It just comes. It's like grits at breakfast in the South. They just come. You don't order them, they just come, right? We all know this. But he says, what must I do? Me, my little old self, inherit eternal life. Now, that's a good question. Eternal life, now that really means not just life everlasting, everlasting, on and on, forever and ever. It means a quality of life. What must I do to receive a quality life, a life with God, in relationship with God? Well, that's a good question. What must I do? Really, that is a good question. And Jesus says, being a good person, Teacher, you ask a question by asking another question. He says, well, what is, it written, what is written in the law? What, how do you read it? He's throwing the test again back on Jesus, okay? I love it. And the man, this attorney says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will Hear this, live. You will have life. You will be alive, in other words. Wow, okay, good. But, I always got a but in here somewhere, don't we? But, the attorney wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Oh, now, that's a big question, isn't it? But it's an important question because we all understand this question, and particularly, I mean, in our day and time. I mean, it's a, it's a question. Who is my neighbor? In his day and time, is the Roman who is occupying my land and is saddling us with these heavy taxes, is this one my neighbor? Or how about these Gentiles that come in here? You know, these filthy Gentiles, you know, they're just... They're just unclean. Are they my neighbor? And we don't rem don't you remember Jesus? We got the Samaritans up here. Them nasty half-breed Samaritans. Those new good Samaritans. The only good Samaritan is a dead Samaritan. Remember Jesus? Are they my neighbor? Who is my neighbor, Jesus? He wants a question answered with an abstract answer, I think. And Frederick B. Beekner suggests the man is looking for a legal definition. And here's what Beekner offers. 
Henceforth, a neighbor shall be defined as meaning a person of Jewish descent and owning property within the legal boundaries of the state of Israel. One is relieved of all responsibilities of any kind in matters to any person outside those two parameters. Court settled. Good definition for a neighbor? Not so sure. I am really not so sure. Has some limitations, doesn't it? Has some serious boundaries. Has some rules, as Emily mentioned. Now, we all know rules are good. As Emily said, yes, rules are very good. They can be very helpful. But Jesus doesn't give that kind of answer that Beekner says he was, the attorney was offering. Instead, he tells this story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and when he fell into the hands of robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, another person of the road, and when he came to the place and saw the man, he passed by also on the other side, But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity, mercy on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and water. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you have made. Which of these three, now here's the other question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Wow, it's such a such marvelous, such a marvelous parable. It's called the Good Samaritan, even though that word is never mentioned in, in the story. You never hear the word Good Samaritan, just the word Samaritan. He's actually merciful. It should be called the merciful Samaritan. But the idea of a good Samaritan in the Jewish years was just an oxymoron. There is no such thing as a good Samaritan or merciful Samaritan. There are only bad Samaritans. So, you know, this story might be titled The Good, the Bad, the Ugly. That would be appropriate. I I want you to pay attention, if you will, just look at the picture you have in the front of your bulletin. It's just a marvelous picture because you will notice that it shows the the priest and a Levite continuing down the road by the man who is wounded. But the good Samaritan attends to him and the good Samaritan has a, a a beast of burden with him, a horse, a mule. Isn't that marvelous the way this picture is written, drawn? It shows the whole picture, the whole thing, how they passed along And they were isolated and unrelated to the man who was wounded under the tree, under the rock. Well, the good, the bad, and ugly. How should we talk about this? The good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, You know, on the one hand, those two who are walking away, they're, they're, they're ugly and they're bad, aren't they? Because they've ignored this man who is on the side of the road. And they probably have good excuses to just walk on, just to keep walking on. I don't want to be involved. You've been there, haven't you? You've seen someone in need. I don't have time. I don't have the energy. I don't know what's going on here. It could be a setup. I could be robbed. You know, something like that. Your mind just goes in crazy directions like that. And they might have good excuses. I'm going to let them off the hook on this, okay? So to some extent. Because we all need to be off the hook, don't we? I can think of numerous times myself where someone is in need and I just keep on going.
I had something like that happen this week with me, and I said, why didn't I call her? Why did I ignore? Why did I not call? And I was reminded of this story. The priest and the Levite who just keep on going and they just keep on going because their mind is occupied with other things. It happens, doesn't it, folks? It happens. Admit it, confess it, and learn from it. Okay. All right, that now, we got the, you know, the bad and the ugly. We've dealt with them. Now, who is good? We've got the good, the bad, and the ugly. Who's, who's good here in this, in this story? Is it the man who's helping? Is he the good one? Well, yes, he's the good one, isn't he? Because he stops and lends a hand. And it's such a marvelous story. It's such a marvelous story because we all recognize that that's who we want to be, isn't it? Isn't that how this story goes? If I were to ask you to identify yourself with anybody in this story, you'd say, well, sometimes I'm like the priest and Levite. I pass on down the road. I keep on walking. I know sometimes I have acted like that. I, yes, it's true. It's true. It's true. But who I really want to be is I want to be the one who stops and lends a hand. Isn't that what you want to be? Everybody say, yes. Yes. I want to be like Jesus in my heart. Right? Of course. It's where we want to be. Now, the preacher is getting too long already in the, in the pulpit. Already broken the rule. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. The good preachers, normally what they would say is they would say, all right, you folks, you go out there and you be good Samaritans. I want you to be the best Samaritan you can possibly be. You are to be a magnificent, outstanding, marvelous book picture of what it means to be good. You be good. A good Samaritan. Right? And so we have an amen and a benediction and go home. And so you spend the rest of your day and your week trying to be this good Samaritan, right? Right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Do not get me wrong. I am not saying do not do that. But is this the one who's good? The Samaritan. What about the fellow who's, who's injured? Who is that? May I suggest that that's you and me? We are the ones who have been beaten and robbed and left half dead on the side of the road. Do you believe that? We have a church member who is lying in a hospital in Knoxville, Tennessee right now, beaten up by cancer. Have you ever lost a loved one? Have you ever lost a job? Has anyone that you thought you were in love with say to you, it's over, no, no, no. Have you ever been in the ditch of life? Yes. We're old enough, we have all been there, haven't we? We are old enough to know the ditch where we are beaten up and left for half dead, and we wonder, will anyone, anyone help? Or am I utterly alone and isolated, and others just pass me by? It's important that we be good Samaritans like this one who stopped and lent, lent assistance. Tom Long, who was our Mullen speaker several years ago, tells the story about how he was one day at his grandmother's house and there were all the pictures of the family on the wall and in the very middle of these pictures was a picture of a man that was obviously dressed 
in a Union Army uniform, and this is South Carolina. This is South Carolina, the heart of Dixie, and you know. He's dressed in this uniform, this Army uniform, a Union uniform. He's right there in the middle of all the family pictures, and Tom says to his, his grandmother, what in the world is a Union officer picture being displayed in our home, our southern home, amidst, in the middle of all our family. What is going on, Graham? And she says, Tom, he was a chaplain in the Union Army in April 1862 at the Battle of Williamsburg. Your great-great-grandfather, who was only 19 years of age, serving in the Confederate Army, was in that battle. And in that battle, he was wounded in the knee. He was a serious wound. Almost his leg, leg was almost torn off his body. So he lay there on the battlefield for a whole day and night, and the next day, this Union officer chaplain went out into the battlefield to, to check on the Union wounded, and he came upon your father and saw that he was still alive but bleeding to death. He picked him up, put him on his horse, and took him to the medical unit of the Union Army where they did amputate his leg, but he survived. And later, after he survived, this chaplain took up some money so your great-great-grandfather could go home. Later, your great-great-grandfather, as you know, became a minister. And that officer's name was Joseph Trichwell. And they stayed friends and corresponded with one another all the days of his life. What do you think, folks? Was he a pretty good Samaritan? Well, I mean, he was a union officer. I mean, you know, us Southerners, don't we have some pride about ourselves to stand up and say who is what and what is who? Ah, oh, but he was a good Samaritan. He was, wasn't he? Isn't that a great story? Isn't that a marvelous story? We had a family down in Franklin. They had two children, two young children, both of them under three years of age. And an issue arose with one of the with the husband and wife living in this mobile home, and I mean a mobile home. Hmm, it might fit in this choir loft, okay? Because I visited them and I know they had two children, two young children, and they had a problem in the family, and they ended up having to adopt a three-month-old. I went and visited. And we helped. I say we, Emily. This church helped is what I mean because we have a pastor's discretionary fund. And we realized that they needed to move out of this dilapidated little teeny mobile home. And we did it, folks. We put a $10,000 down payment on them to buy a house in Franklin. Can I hear an Amen. Amen. <laughs> they closed on the house last Friday. Wonderful, beautiful house. Nice neighborhood. Do you feel good? I feel good. I feel like a good Samaritan. Only I'm not a Samaritan, am I? Is expected of me and Emily, maybe the church, yes indeed. But what I'm trying to tell you is that we do good, we do good, we do good, don't we? We do very good. Because we are able and willing to help those who need help. And that's so, so important. 
so important. We've done other things. I can't, I could tell you of two or three more stories that you just go, wow. We do good, very good, and I am thankful we do good and have the means and the ability to do good. But here's what I want to say to you. One day somebody said to Jesus, good teacher, and Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's only one who's good, and that is the Almighty. The Good Samaritan story. You know who the Good Samaritan is? It's not you and me. It's Jesus. He was the one who was cast out. He was the one who was despised. He was the one who was taken to be crucified. He was the half-breed, the no good. Crucify him, crucify him. Just get rid of him. He was the good Samaritan. And he went to us. He has come to us. All of us who are in the ditch. And we know that. That's why we are here, isn't it? Because we know that Jesus is with us. And whatever happens, whatever happens, whatever ditch happens in my life, Jesus will come. He will bind up my wounds. He will pour the the wine and the oil. And he will make me whole. And he will give me hope. that none can give and healing like none can give. And that is why He is our Lord and Savior. Paul said it so well. While we were weak, you hear it? While we were down and out, Christ died for us. And Christ prays for us. He died and rose and prays for us. Friends, yes, the rule is help those who are in need. It's a good rule. It's an important rule. But I want you to go deeper. Trust in God. Trust in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you would stand in body or in spirit with our affirmation of faith you have in the bulletin, Friends, what is your affirmation of faith? This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. If we hold it fast that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised, and on the third day, and that He was first to the women, then to Peter, and to the twelve, And then to many faithful witnesses, we believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Please be seated. And as you are seated, I invite you to take the friendship pads that you find in the pews, whether you are just visiting for the day or whether you have been here every week since the last time you can remember not being in church. If you will fill those out so that not only we might know that you are here, but also you can uh, check in on the neighbors you're worshiping near this morning. I know there are people here who have walked in this church for the first time today, and we are so glad that you are here. This church does indeed welcome all who pass this way, and it is our delight here in Highlands as a vacation destination and as a summer home and as a year-round home to be a church that welcomes all and hope that you find a place here, whether you come once or come many times. A couple of announcements for you are uh, listed on the back of the bulletin. I won't go through them all, but right after worship, we do have a very brief uh, congregational meeting that will take place. 
Next Sunday, uh, we are going to have the joy and honor of um, the, the musical leadership of Coro Vocati, a singing group from, a, a choral group from Atlanta who will be on retreat here. They'll also be providing a wonderful concert for us on Saturday at 5 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. Come and bring friends. You won't want to miss it. We'll have wor- uh, lunch after worship next week, so go ahead and cancel whatever plans you otherwise have. It will be a great meal that we can enjoy together. There's plenty of other things to pay attention to in the life of this church, and we hope all of you will be able to participate in one way or another. And now let us turn to God at this time for our prayers of the people. Let's pray. God of love, we draw near to you this morning in prayer as you have drawn near to us this day and every day. How grateful we are for the gift of your love for us, poured out by your Holy Spirit, even here, even now. How grateful we are to come together in your holy house, to join with others in praise and worship. How grateful and how hopeful we are, O God, that as we offer ourselves to you this morning, we will grow ever deeper in love with you. There are so many reminders, Holy One, of the fragility of this life that you have given us. And while we have lived at times as though we are invincible, remind us again that all power and all glory are yours and yours alone. Make us mindful too, O God, that it is the very nature of our fragile, precious lives that draws us closer and closer to each other. For it is only in our vulnerability that we learn to love. So make us mindful, we pray, and willing to serve those who are on the very edge, the very precipice of life, the young and the old, the poor and the destitute, the victims of war, neglect, and abuse, orphans, refugees, and prisoners, and people who have no homes, or no steady source of food or clean water, or no reliable or affordable access to doctor's care. God of love, lead us to notice first and then care for those who are lonely or isolated, for those grieving the loss of loved ones, or the loss of livelihood, or the loss of dreams due to unforeseen circumstances. Guide us into the wisdom and patience to address the needs of those who are anxious, depressed, or suicidal, of those who are overworked and underpaid. Great healer of us all, we ask your presence, your tender care, and your peace to fall upon those who are sick and recovering, those who are seeking treatment or facing diagnoses, and those who are making difficult choices about their lives or the lives of their loved ones this day. As we pray for all these, your beloved children, we acknowledge our own place on the list of those in need of prayer. And so as we seek prayer for others, we also call upon you to care for us, for our families, for our church, and for our communities and neighborhoods. And assured of your love and comforted by your peace and confident in your presence with us here and as we head out into the week ahead, we pray with all earnestness that we will indeed go and follow your example. We pray with hope that we will go and do likewise. We offer this and every unique prayer in our hearts this day in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, with joyful hearts, let us continue to worship God with God's tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is true that we seek to do good because you taught us to do good, because you showed us your goodness in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we ask that good might be done with these gifts, and not only with these gifts, but with our whole lives, so that we might do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with you every day. We ask in Christ's name. Amen.
If you will please be seated for the congregational meeting. If you are not a member of this congregation, you may certainly leave if you are not voting in this congregational meeting. Maybe I shouldn't have asked them to leave. <laughs> Y'all come on back. <laughs> Y'all come on back. <laughs> I will designate Delane Nelson as the clerk of this meeting. Delane, do we have a quorum after so many have left? <laughs> we do, thank you. That's good to know. We will use the prayer, the pastoral prayer, as the opening prayer for this meeting. And at this time, I set before you the nomination of Moselle Edwards, Marty Boone, and Rick Trevathan to serve on the nominating church nominating committee of the class of 2023. Are there any other names to place in nomination at this time? Not hearing none of any. May I have a motion that nominations be closed? Do I have a second? Motion has been made to close nominations and it has been seconded. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. So moved. Let us come then to the nominations again for the class of church nominating committee to class of 2023. Moses Edwards, Marty Boone, and Richard Vathan. May I have a motion that they be placed in nomination for this class? I have a motion. So moved. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor of nominating these three to the church nominating class of 2023 say aye. aye. Any opposed say no. So moved. Congratulations, Rick, <laughs> Mo Moselle, and Marty. Congratulations indeed. Let us have a word of prayer and benediction. Lord, we are thankful for the work of your church, this body known as Highlands First Presbyterian Church. Help us to continue to be your pay people, your witnesses in difficult times and good times of your love and grace poured out in Jesus Christ in the power of your spirit. And so I say to you, friends, go in peace. And remember, you are disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen.